Hello everybody and welcome to Dry Dock episode 110. This week the questions are taken from guide 176, that's the extended guide to the Indiana class and USS Oregon in particular, together with the video on the Spanish Armada, or the Spanish Navy, depending on what you want to call it, of 1898, i.e. the immediate run-up to the Spanish-American War. Gott Jaeger asks, what if the US Navy received the funding for its 1889 15-year naval construction program for 10 long-range battleships and 25 coastal defence battleships. How would European navies respond and how would the Spanish-American War change? Now, I think a lot of this is going to depend on exactly how the fleet build is structured. Because, ultimately, the US Navy, when it started trying to build up its battleship numbers at the end of the 19th century, had been on something of a break from overall capital ship construction, thanks to Congress drawing down funding massively after the American Civil War. And so the initial ships that they tried building, so Maine, Texas, the Indiana class, uh, USS Iowa, the first one as can be seen here, there were a number of mistakes made, and also a number of compromises. Now, fair enough, with the amount of money that's being thrown at them, perhaps the compromises aren't going to necessarily take place, but a lot of the mistakes probably still will be taking place. And one of the major shifts in the period immediately after uh, 1889, so as you go through the 1890s, is the very rapid changes from Harvey armour to Krupp armour, the advent of quick-firing guns in calibers that are suitable for secondary batteries, as well as a number of fairly rapid advances in engine technology. So if you wanted to take a kind of worst-case scenario, the worst-case scenario would be that the ten large long-range battleships are started first presumably on the basis that the USA needs to be able to project a lot of power first and then it can kind of shore up its own defences after that big long-distance shield is in place. And in that case, you'd see those battleships built during the early 1890s, so a lot of them would come equipped with Harvey armour, they would come equipped with slower-firing guns, slightly old-school turret designs, and of course... As we said, there would be probably be a number of mistakes and errors in their design process generally, simply because US ship designers just don't have the experience at this point. Then the coastal battleships get built, but they're obviously going to be smaller, lighter, so they're not going to be able to incorporate all of the advances that we just mentioned, or if they do, they're not going to be able to utilise them quite as well. Um, so, for example, if, you're, if you've got a coastal battleship, if you... Uh, managed to take advantage of, let's say, the quick-firing gun advances. But on a coastal ship, you might only get six or eight six-inch uh, secondary guns in, whereas on a full-sized battleship, then you might get eight, nine, ten, twelve, um, if you're really lucky if you cram them all in. And so you obviously then get more advantage out of it because you've got more guns. So that would be your worst-case scenario. Now, in... Either worst or best case scenario, the Spanish-American War is... It doesn't actually change too much because the US forces they had, especially in the Caribbean and uh, Atlantic theatres, were already more than sufficient. So the sort of the Cuban campaign and such probably doesn't change all that much. What might change very slightly is that you're probably going to have some at least a battleship or two stationed overseas in the Asiatic squadron, which means that Dewey's assault on the Philippines is going to be even more decisive um, than it already was. But that's going to lead to slightly less panic, also you know, less panic in the US, but also probably actually change overall the way the Spanish attempted to respond to the situation, because whilst sending Palayo, their pre-dreadnought battleship, as well as a number of other ships, to the Philippines was possibly a way of getting them back in the historical timeline, even in a worst-case scenario for the US with this 1889 building program, the Spanish aren't going to be dumb enough to send Palayo against two, two or three enemy battleships plus escorts. So... I suppose we probably wouldn't get Olympia because it wouldn't get such a standout role. Olympia would probably just end up being scrapped, which would be a bit of a pity. Um, 
but that is say that's the worst case scenario where the biggest and nastiest chips get built first and then get left behind technologically speaking so it'd be a lot of money down the drain and probably actually make mean that congress would throttle the u.s navy very very hard going into the 1900s the flip side is almost yeah it's, it's com literally completely the other way around if the u.s starts with a slow build program of coastal battleships and starts to ramp it up so given that they've got 25 to build they maybe start off with the indianas with maybe an extra hull or two I take a look at those okay fix those issues work on the next generation and so on and so forth and maybe they build three or four classes of coastal defense battleship ordering them at the rate of maybe four or five um, per class and building on those lessons they would then coincidentally obviously they don't have foresight they're not going to see this coming but coincidentally it would mean that come the late 1890s then and the early 1900s that's when you'd start to see the programs to lay down the sort of full range long distance battleships coming into play and at that point you've got your crop armor you've got your new turret layouts you've got your quick firing guns etc 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 and that would mean that between that and the experience of having churned out probably around 20 or so smaller battleships the chances of then knocking the design out of the park for the long range pre-dreadnoughts is probably actually going to be um pretty high i mean you, you look at the ships the u.s was building historically by the late 1890s you're looking at the illinois class they're not actually half bad a little bit slow uh, as pre-dreadnoughts go at 16 knots but not not awful and then um, you then have the main class which are built just after the Illinois they're right at the turn of the century and again definitely not bad ships in fact the mains kick the speed up to uh, 18 knots so they're pretty much bang on the money as far as decent solid pre-dreadnought designs go and that's with considerably less building experience than they would have had if they'd gone down this potential route. And so what you probably would have seen is something superior to either of those classes being can, being built coming out around about 1880, 1898, 1900. That would have actually put the US in fairly good stead. Hopefully the double stack turret uh, options that they tried in a couple of their classes would have been tried and discarded in the coastal defense battleship classes because they're just a bit silly really um but yeah you would have then seen 10 pretty modern uh pre-dreadnought battleships coming into service over the space of a few years in the early 1900s obviously there is the slight downside that then dreadnought's going to come along and this the theoretically much larger u.s fleet is going to be obsoleted so they're going to have to <laughs> uh, go back uh to the drawing board again but they're going to have an awful lot more shipbuilding design experience behind them which means that in actual fact the south carolinas a might be started earlier they may be the pinnacle of this 15-year building program and b they're probably also going to be slightly larger and therefore pr truly able to serve alongside the other dreadnoughts as opposed to historically where they were kind of shuffled off mostly by the u.s navy to serve with the rest of the pre-dreadnoughts as far as the rest of the European Navy is responding, I think the one who's going to change the most is probably Germany. France doesn't really have that many interests in North America, so they're not particularly threatened by the whole thing. And given that the bulk of the construction is coastal battleships, they're probably proceed with their rather meandering path on pre-dreadnought construction. The British are already churning out massive amounts of pre-dreadnoughts anyway, so they're basically... They'll probably just look at their historical uh, calculation of France and Russia and just scratch out one or the other and substitute in USA and keep on with the uh, the building as the US Navy comes up to preeminence in, in terms of size in the second tier of navies. The Germans are the ones who are most likely to change because they obviously are also, by the late 1890s, looking to be an up-and-coming naval power. So if they're not just having to think about the Royal Navy they're possibly having to think for overseas adventures of having to deal with the US Navy as well that is probably going to prompt them to start building more ships and or faster 
which ironically enough actually probably hurts Germany in the long run, uh, much in the same way as it actually technically in some ways hurts the USA because both navies would end up be going on a massive building spree right about a few years before Dreadnought just rewrites the rule book anyway. Um, but it would actually end up placing both the US Navy and the German Navy in a better position to compete in the Dreadnought race because, again, more ships means more design experience, it means more yards that earn more uh, specialist infrastructure and industry, etc., all built up, ready to go, which means that the Dreadnought arms race would look a lot, lot more interesting, assuming, of course, that Congress doesn't just decide to yank the uh, rug out from under the US Navy again. Matthew Griffiths asks, what exactly is practical battle range during the Second World War for cruisers and destroyers? Now, many of you will have heard me use the term practical battle range at various points in various videos, and this is basically one of my little bugbears when it comes to people estimating how gunnery jewels would pan out, and that is that you can make all sorts of fancy theories and statements about, oh, well, this gun can range out to this range, and this other gun can only range out so far, and therefore this ship can open fire when the enemy ship can't return fire. And sometimes that's true, but broadly speaking, it's not. And especially in World War Two, it's definitely not. Usually the only times when it's actually true is either when you're talking about completely unequal contests like destroyer versus battleship, or if you're talking about ships where for whatever reason there's a specific and very deliberate limitation on one side's gunnery such as say um, German guns having very minimal elevation at Jutland and immediately before things like Dogger Bank. But the thing is it's very rare that you're going to actually be able to hit anything or hit anything very often or with any guarantee of success at these kinds of extreme ranges. Um, so for example people do like to make a big deal about sort of how far Yamato's guns could shoot or how far Iowa's guns could shoot and they're like, oh well we, we can engage at 35,000 yards. It's, yes, technically you can. You'll probably hit with like maybe four or five shells out of your entire magazine and it'll take you half an hour to score that first hit anyway in all likelihood unless you're incredibly lucky. Plus beyond a certain range mathematically speaking a fast ship that's steering by the light of your last salvo can just physically guarantee to avoid your shot unless you happen to have italian battleship levels of spread so the practical battle range at least as defined by drac is the range at which you can expect to both fire your guns and reach the target but also you can realistically hope to regularly and repeatedly hit your target once you have established the range and, to be perfectly honest, if when you look at the various capabilities of various warships and you look at the ranges they're engaged at compared to the ranges of their guns, it seems like most of the navies, outside of special circumstances such as, uh, say, the Shan Horse going after Glorious, tended to agree. So, if you look at the engagements of various cruisers during World War II, what you'll notice is that once you factor out things like night engagements or engagements in very bad weather, which obviously have their own limitations on what range you can engage with your guns, you actually tend to find that daylight engagements between cruisers normally open around about the same kind of distance, which is about eighteen to 22,000 yards, with an average of around 20,000 yards as the opening salvo range. Now, some battles tend to stay at this range for quite a while. Most of them tend to involve some attempt at closing. But I would say that, yeah, around about 20,000 yards, plus or minus a bit, is the upper limit of practical battle range during the Second World War for cruisers. There are a few times when cruisers did engage at longer ranges, because there are always exceptions. Um, the Italians in particular, as sort of like in things like the opening actions of the Battle of Calabria do like to open fire just that little bit earlier and obviously fire people fire back at them because well your guns can reach out that far but the other thing you want to bear in mind with cruisers is not only that well eight inch or guns and six inch guns can't quite reach out as far as battleship guns in the first place but also fire control systems on cruisers are going to be smaller and less precise in most cases. Again, there are exceptions because you might have a very, very modern cruiser like, say, a Baltimore class 
and you might say compare that with a very old battleship that's not been particularly heavily modernized like Ramillies or something like that and there you might find that actually sort of width of range finders accuracy of radar fire control and plotting systems etc is actually more comparable but broadly speaking a cruiser's fire control system will be less advanced and less accurate than a battleship so between that and the slightly more limited range this is why you see cruisers fighting at around about 20,000 yards give or take and then closing the range down as appropriate when it comes to destroyers the range drops again again partly because the guns can only fire out so far again partly because in this case definitely the fire control equipment and in some cases depending on the type of destroyer if any present is going to be again significantly less capable compared especially compared to things like the equipment on cruisers and battleships but also you've got a factor in that destroyers are almost always going to be equipped with torpedoes and they do want to use those when possible obviously ideally when you're using them against uh, large ships but even against other destroyers they would quite often attempt to use their torpedoes against each other so this desire to get into torpedo range as quickly as possible and ideally if possible engage with torpedoes before the other side spots you did tend to dictate a lot of destroyer engagements anyway and Pure destroyer on destroyer engagements were somewhat rare in World War II compared to other actions, since, where possible, um, navies that could tended to send out light cruisers to support their destroyers to give them that bit of extra punch, and destroyers were one of the primary types of vessel that would love to fight night actions. So, again, that kind of mitigates on the range somewhat, and of course, you also have the fact that destroyers are very often found fighting against ships much bigger than they are as part of overall formation battles. So um, the destroyers are boxing in the Bismarck or going after Scharnhorst and things like that. But with all those caveats aside, you tend to see destroyers, if they're forced to either by circumstance or choice engage in primarily gunfights, they seem to start their shooting in earnest around about the six to eight thousand yard range again give or take a uh, little bit and then try and close in a lot because most of the time they're trying to lob torpedoes from closer than that if they can so yeah if you're if you're looking at the pure gunfighting expect a sort of high four digit figure for that for range for destroyers as practical battle range from which they'll close down cruisers 20,000 ish yards longer in slightly longer in a lot of times in the Mediterranean but generally that and then closing down and then battleships probably 24,000 ish yards and then closing down and once again that doesn't mean there aren't exceptions to that case it doesn't mean that hits didn't occur above the, those ranges it just means that that's where the majority of the fighting and the majority of the hits were going to take place and you'll find an awful lot more engagements that uh, where shells were fired over those ranges where nothing much was accomplished as compared to the very very few where occasionally a, the odd shell would hit home pringles gaming asks 1920s u.s navy versus 1920s japanese navy who wins well an awful lot changes over the 1920s so i think it's going to depend very very much on which end of the 1920s you're talking about if it's the early 1920s or maybe 1922 up to about 1924 ish then i'm almost always going to have to give it to the u.s navy straight off because the u.s navy at that point has okay it doesn't have the world's greatest cruiser screen but it has a cruiser screen of sorts it has massive numbers of destroyers and assuming that they can all drag themselves across the pacific in sheer capital ship terms, just sort of coming up off the tail end of commissioning the Colorados, the US has all the standards, and in the very, very early part, when you're talking from pre-Washington, um, a fair number of other earlier battleships as well, against which Japan has the four Congos, um, a little bit of a hodgepodge of late pre-dreadnoughts and early dreadnoughts, and then in terms of serious battle line units, they've got the Fusos and the Isays. 
um, maybe maybe the Koachis at that point, um, although they're really second line units at this at this stage. So they've only got four capital ships plus Nagato and Mutsu just. So yeah, they they're so stupidly outnumbered that assuming they don't get something very very lucky on the way in, the U.S. fleet's just going to roll over them. However. <laughs> Weirdly enough, as you go through the 1920s and Japan starts to build up its cruiser and destroyer force much more considerably and they start developing their whole Kantai Kesen doctrine with the night actions and everything. At that point, in the yeah, 1925 to 19, December 31st, 1929, Japan's still not going to win the war. Overall, the US Navy and the USA has that huge crushing industrial advantage and if the US decides to stick out the war they will win um, admittedly the USA is going through a bit of an isolationist phase so depending on the circumstances of the war the US could be brought to terms but in that latter stage of the 1920s I do think it's reasonably possible when you look at the uh, early war performance of US um, lighter forces cruisers and destroyers etc versus the Japanese at that point, the idea of we're going to force our way through the U.S. Navy's cruiser and destroyer screen and launch mass torpedo assaults on the battleships to whittle their numbers down enough for our capital ships to finish them off, that might actually work, at least for the first big battle. Um, I'd actually put greater than even odds on the Japanese light units force and probably with the Congos accompanying forcing their way through getting some fairly nasty attacks on the US battle line in and badly reducing the American fighting strength which would then in theory possibly allow the Japanese to win the gunfight at the end of it but with that said all that means is you've won one big battle yes in an isolationist USA that might get the US to come to terms with you but you're not going to actually win a war that way because as I said before if the US decides to stick it out they're just going to come back and they're going to come back again and they're going to come back again and eventually you will die the Rosabella Hotel and Convention Center uh, so apparently we have talking hotels here now asks from what I've read about the Vizcaya and its associated class of armored cruisers it tells me that they could have been better able to stand and it actually expected to do their job that is to fight if the armor had been reduced in thickness and made wider or they'd reduced the main battery caliber and put in more guns with a higher fire rate so yes the Vizcaya class in a lot of ways embodies something of a dead end of thinking when it comes to armored cruisers it's really designed almost as a secondary line of battle vessel which is why it's got this ridiculously thick armor um, to withstand very heavy incoming shot. It's got these very large guns, which the idea obviously in theory is that it, they should be able to damage battleships. And whilst this was for a short period seen as a secondary role of the armoured cruiser, it didn't really pan out to all that much because it meant you had a smaller secondary battery. You couldn't fit as many main battery guns, whereas if you look at a number of contemporary armoured cruisers, they're able to fit three or four uh, main battery guns even if they're not in twin mounts for and after you at least get some wing turrets in there and of course the armor can be more distributed because although this thing has this 10 to 12 inch thick belt of armor as you can see it's so shallow uh, that it doesn't actually protect the ammunition passages it doesn't protect the majority of the machinery and yeah, Hitting it would actually be fairly impressive as a terms of a feat of gunnery. Now you can see from that midship section up there that there is actually substantial coal bunkers and coal, roughly it was held, that a foot of coal equaled an inch of armour. So they're not as completely virtually unprotected as they might appear just looking at the side profile. But of course you can't rely on that because if your ship is steaming around your coal levels are going to decrease and even if you haven't massively decreased your coal levels where exactly that coal has shifted from in terms of which bunkers have you emptied which bunkers are partially empty where in those bunkers has the coal been taken from means that your overall theoretical protection is going to be completely incalculable at any given time and if you're at the tail end of long voyage 
then your protection levels will have gone down substantially. Now, there is a certain amount of argument to be made that at the time that these ships were being designed, quick-firing technology hadn't really reached the sort of 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11 inch guns world. And so you might think, well, having a few bigger guns, if they've got a similar rate of fire to these small guns, the individual hits will be slightly better off um, in terms of how much damage you do to the enemy. But at the same time, it imposes a significant weight penalty on your, your ship that reduces your armament elsewhere secondary battery for instance so i think if you were going to be designing these ships from the ground up again assuming you're limited to approximately the same displacement then yeah i would probably thin the hull armor out quite significantly um and spread it a bit more basically take it back to what an armored cruiser was originally designed to do which is to have enough armor to stand up to protected cruisers and bear in mind the at this point even your most generous protector cruisers have probably only got a few six inch guns and mostly smaller weapons you don't need a massive thickness of armor to protect you and at least for ammunition and machinery protection doubling the height of that belt would certainly be a start trim a little bit off of the ends saves a bit more weight and given that it's 10 to 12 inches you really only need maybe four inches to protect you against four and six inch guns at the time you can probably get away with thinning that belt right down and even spreading it out to about double the surface area. You'd still save about a third of the weight, which is quite handy. Downgrade those 11-inch guns to something a bit more realistic. Okay, maybe the 10-inch guns of the uh, Christabel Cologne type, or take it further down, go for an 8-inch gun um, either end. And to be honest, with if you go to 8-inch, you might be able to get two at each end, which would provide quite the nice bit of firepower there. But even if you can only get one 8-inch at either end, the amount of weight that you've saved will enable you to have a much bigger secondary battery. And as uh, was seen with things like the Spanish-American War, you're not going to have to worry about being outranged because the ranges that these battles being fought at, your secondary battery is equally as in range as your main battery. And I think that would have given the Spanish a much, much better vessel. And apart from anything else, to be honest, if you've got an overall displacement target, if you save a ton of weight by downgrading those end weapons to sort of eight inch types and saving about a third of your overall armor weight, you can actually put that into a larger, longer ship, which means you probably go a bit faster, a lot more endurance and space where you can stick in some more secondary battery guns. So overall, yeah, definitely could have been designed a lot better. Tommy Maguire asks, In the video, at around 7 minutes 15 seconds in, there's a US cruiser with enormous yard arms on its masts. What are they for? Sails seem a little bit silly. Well, the vessel in question is in fact USS Baltimore, he is seen here in another photo, and as you can see from the front of the ship, the yard arms did actually come in pretty useful, <laughs> albeit as a uh, gigantic spindle on which to hang everybody's laundry but there you go but in all seriousness sails aren't wouldn't actually be a terrible guess um bearing in mind that baltimore and its immediate predecessor uss charleston were the first u.s cruisers not to have sails um their respective immediate predecessors the abc cruisers atlanta boston and chicago they were all fully fully rigged for sail um, Charleston and Baltimore being the first two years cruisers, as we said, that weren't, but the yard arm, as you can see, is still there and quite substantial. Now, there's a number of reasons for still retaining the yard arm. Mainly is you can see this big fighting top, and especially on the rear uh, fighting top there, you can see there's a, a gun, fairly substantial weapon, not a personal weapon. And with the extra weight of this kind of heavy fighting top and, and weaponry, you need, did need some way to stabilize the mast. And as you can see, these masts are not tripod masts. They're not big, heavy masts. Uh, they're not even cage masts. And so having the yard arm there with all the extra lines you can see did actually help to a certain degree with stabilization. And perhaps more importantly, although the ship was not fitted with sails, um, it was still a possibility because bear in mind what's the reason for having sails this late into the steam era when you're talking about atlanta boston and chicago well it's because well fuel efficiency for one thing but also you might lose your engines for whatever reason whether you run out of fuel whether something breaks etc etc 
And so sails were still seen as a useful backup power source. And in the case is of Charleston and Baltimore, they're taking a bit of a step into a new world. So having that yard arm there means that in an emergency, an absolute emergency, they probably could rig an auxiliary sail or two. It's not going to get them anywhere fast, but it would at least get them somewhere other than just drifting around and hoping there aren't any rocks in the way, which is a pretty useful feature to have. You will have also be relieved to know that the yard arms were removed subsequently in a small refit, and so later photos of Baltimore no longer have them in place. B.J. Turin, I think, um, asks, why did Britain push for a lower main armament gun calibre for battleships in the naval treaty period of the 1920s and 30s? I Why push for the 14-inch gun, a gun they didn't actually have in service, when they already had plenty of 15 and 16-inch guns in service? Why not stay with a proven and powerful 16-inch gun of the Nelson-class battleships? There were a few different reasons, some to do with just straight-out economy, like it would be cheaper to build a 14-inch gun battleship than it would be to build a 15 or a 16-inch gun battleship, because you've got to remember, although the six 15 and 16-inch guns already existed, obviously on the Queen Elizabeth, Revenges, Renowns, Hood, and obviously the 16s on Nelson, by the time the naval treaties came around for the London Naval Treaty, 1930 and onwards, and especially the second London Naval Treaty, which is where they really pushed in for the 14-inch weapon and got it in the mid-30s, the 15-inch 42 and the 16-inch on the Nelsons had been out of production for a while, so there wouldn't have been that much benefit in reopening the production lines. Um, the, they were actually at points or even pushing for 12-inch armament, although quite how seriously they were taking it and how much that was uh, maybe just a bargaining position to go sort of if we ask for 12 and the limit is 16 then maybe everyone compromise in 14 and that's roughly what we want uh, it depends who you ask as to where that, that that 12 inch proposal sits on the spectrum of plausibility because I mean apart from anything else it's Within Britain itself, it's not entirely certain that the Admiralty was not so much in favour of it. The politicians obviously being able to build much smaller 12-inch gunships are uh, somewhat more in favour of it. But anyway, the other reason which was sort of predominated on this was a recognition of what you could do with the 35,000 ton limit. Because when you had things like Nelson, Colorado and Nagato... They'd all been built in an era where you didn't have to worry that much about air attack. You had some worry about torpedoes, but not as much as by the 1930s. And so on 35,000 tons, you could fit 16-inch guns, relatively decent armor against 16-inch guns, if you if you really put your back into it. And bear in mind also that speed at the time called for a ship capable of 21 to there's a low 20s of knots so colorado's 21 nelson's 23 nagato's 25 26 um and obviously that requires less engine space by the time of the mid 1930s everyone's looking at faster battleships so 28 knots roughly for the average treaty battleship that requires even with the advances in machinery that requires more machinery more boilers and a longer hull form which means a bigger hull more displacement and you've now got to worry quite seriously about torpedoes. Torpedoes have gotten bigger and better, so you've got to have more displacement put towards your torpedo defence. You've also got to have more displacement put towards anti-aircraft batteries, because that's now a very big threat. And whilst there were certain conditions within the Washington Naval Treaty that allowed you to refit older ships and add displacement, those didn't exist for new-built ships. So if you compare building... The Nelson, which just about managed to get inside the 35,000 ton treaty limit for the British, since they're the ones who propose this 14-inch gun. Now you imagine trying to build the same ship, but it's now got to be five knots faster. It's got to have a whole new suite of guns, namely the light to medium caliber anti-aircraft weapons. The secondary battery, which in Nelson was six-inch twins, is now going to have to be dual-purpose, and dual-purpose guns carry a weight penalty. 
you've got to improve the torpedo defenses, etc. And somehow you've got to do all this without increasing the displacement. It's not going to work. So the other big driver was basically the, the Admiralty's designers sat down and they actually calculated that with the new demands on various bits and pieces of the ship's design and displacement allocation, you could build a balanced ship that had decent torpedo protection, decent anti-aircraft protection, decent speed, and was armoured against its own guns on 35,000 tonnes if those main guns were 14-inch. If you still had 16-inch, you'd have to sacrifice something. So you could either build a ship that was like good anti-aircraft guns, 16-inch armament, ar armour against 16-inch guns, sounds fantastic, except you'll probably have no torpedo defence and crawl along at 20 knots. Alternatively, you could make one that went 28 knots and was perfectly fine against incoming torpedoes, but you wouldn't be able to actually defend against 16-inch shells, and the first aircraft that showed up would be able to circle you all day, you'd never be able to do anything about it, and so on and so forth. So the 14-inch gun was in, in some ways also an attempt to try and allow them to build a balanced design without being dragged off in directions they didn't really want to be. Atomic Babel asks, The Royal Navy's T-Class submarines were famous for having the largest forward-firing torpedo salvo with six internal and four external tubes. How often was a 10-torpedo salvo used on a single or group of targets, and can the external tubes be reloaded at sea by the sub's crew, or was reloading performed by a depot or tender? As regards reloading the external tubes at sea... <laughs> It's technically possible. Um, most things are if you throw enough brute force and ignorance at them, but it's not exactly something that you'd want to be doing practically if you had any choice in the matter at all, or there wasn't a really, really pressing need because, well, they're external tubes, so that means you're going to have to fish a torpedo out of the submarine's internal storage, bring it up onto deck without the assistance of an external crane and manhandle it over to the torpedo tube and stick it in, which, <laughs> as you can probably see, is not going to be the easiest of tasks. Um, but, as I say, all things are possible if you've got enough people willing to give it a go. Quite why you'd want to do that, I'm not entirely sure, but never mind. Um, maybe just to prove that you could. As far as the 10 torpedo salvo, this was used on a semi-regular basis. Against the average target, it wouldn't be used. Against uh, even a partic particularly important single target, you'd prefer to just use the, the six tubes. Because to be honest, if you're firing six torpedoes on a target solution, if you're going to miss with six, chances are your calculation so badly off you'll miss with ten anyway. Um... Where the 10-tube solution was used was generally either if there were a bunch of high-value targets together and you wanted to try and hit more than one with a single salvo. And bear in mind, if you've got a big group of important targets, you're probably not going to get into a position where you're going to either get very close, which will improve the accuracy of your torpedoes, or indeed have more than a chance or two to actually fire said torpedoes. So being able to lob 10 torpedoes in a fan at, from a distance and then running away is actually a fairly good survival technique, especially if you want to also hit some nice targets. The other uh, times that the 10 salvo was used was on things like where they found a singular very important target and they just wanted to make absolutely especially sure because, as I say, generally speaking, those external tubes are one-off uh, launchers until you can get back and restock. But if you are going after, say, a Deutschland-class panzer ship or uh, a Japanese heavy cruiser late in the war. There aren't that many of them around. You're not likely to run into another one or anything particularly more valuable, at which point, if the solution's a little bit skewy or you're having to fire from a relatively long range, then, well, why not launch the 10? It gives you a slightly higher chance of hitting and or if you've either been a relatively tight grouping, um, then you might hit them with three or four torpedoes instead of two or three torpedoes. And against particularly tough targets, that could be the difference between crippling a target and making sure it's definitely sunk. 
Patreon questions now, and Trevorius asks, if on December 8th, 1941, Hitler calls up Japan and demands they go to war with the USSR in exchange for Germany going to war with the USA, and Japan, seeing that the Eastern USSR seems ripe for the taking, accepts, to what extent would the Japanese Navy be capable of operations in Arctic conditions along the Northeast Passage or the North Sea Route? B, given their commitments elsewhere, what could the Japanese Navy have reasonably spared in 1942 to prevent convoys from getting to Russia? And C, could the Japanese Navy have succeeded in blockading Russia from Allied supplies, thus possibly giving Germany the win in Europe, or at least until atomic weapons are developed? So the Japanese Navy is never going to be operating large elements as part of an Axis force over in the North Sea, uh, Arctic Ocean, over on the western side of things. Um, apart from the fact they'd have to get past Britain, and I'm sure the Atlantic portion of the USN as well, in order to even physically get there, the other problem that they would have is Germany had to scrape and scrimp to get enough fuel for the ships that it had in Norway, regardless, uh, by the mid-war period. So adding in a bunch of additional fuel guzzling vessels it's not going to help matters all that much and uh, if there's one thing they're not doing they're not bringing their own fuel with them um certainly not more uh, than whatever's left in their tanks when they show up i mean japan itself is short on on fuel as well so that side of things i think is is pretty much ruled out so they're not going to be blockading russia anytime soon um could they have spared anything in 42 to prevent convoys getting to Russia? Well, the Americans were running convoys to the eastern side of Russia up until um, they got involved in the war with Japan. And to a certain extent, even after that, certain heavily escorted convoys at various points were actually still run, um, albeit obviously not in, not immediately. Um, and... With with Japanese aircraft having such a long range, they probably could have interdicted that convoy route if it had continued for whatever reason with long-range naval aircraft like G3Ms and G4Ms, etc. Because the US isn't going to be sending a carrier, even if a carrier could operate in the high Arctic um, in the northwest Pacific. And so they'd be pretty much unopposed. In a lot of ways, it would be kind of like the Luftwaffe having... A go at the Arctic convoys over in the west. Um, as far as Japanese ships being capable of operations in Arctic conditions, um, it depends what ships. Uh, I think the Fourth Fleet incident rather and the Tomoruzu incident rather wonderfully underlines exactly how vulnerable Japanese were, ships were to stability issues. Now, okay, they reinforced... Uh, rebuilt and lightened those ships but that meant that those ships were now uh, just about suitable for operations in the regular pacific ocean if you want to factor in dozens of tons if not more hundreds of tons of ice building up high on the ships as well and then chuck in arctic storms uh, there's not going to be a lot of the more recent stuff that the japanese have built that's going to be able to take it uh, ironically enough some of their older ships um, from the late 1910s and early 1920s would actually probably do a much better job of it before because that's before they got quite as far down the rabbit hole with the super lightweight <laughs> uh, building techniques so yeah I think also some of the capital ships well obviously the capital ships would do better anywhere they're more stable period but um, sending the Fusos for example up to do northwest pacific arctic convoy interdiction if those convoys were still running would certainly be doable i mean it's not like they did an awful lot else i mean the early part of world war ii and they're not too far away from japan if they do need to be recalled for some hypothetical decisive battle situation so there's a limited amount that they could do for northwest pacific convoy routes if indeed um they wanted to and the americans were still sending them but outside of that then they're not really going to go and operate outside of the Pacific over in the Barents Sea or whatever. Um, certainly not for very long anyway. Nickboy302 asks, What did carrier pilots do when their carrier was sunk 
and they were still flying. It largely depended on the overall situation that the fleet in general was in and where they were. Because um, obviously you're not going to land on a, a carrier that's been sunk for obvious reasons, but if you were, say, operating relatively close to friendly shores, at least within a certain amount of reason, you could try and head that way. So, for example, if you were, say, flying from a carrier in the Mediterranean, um, if your carrier was knocked out of action so it couldn't recover aircraft or uh, sunk, I mean... Uh, the only instances when that happens things like Eagle, where there are other carriers in formation, so that's kind of not applicable, let's say that's hypothetical, then with most naval aircraft, you probably could make a concerted run for a friendly airbase, or at least a friendly shore. If there were other carriers in the formation, then you would probably try and land on them instead, because that's a much safer bet than potentially exhausting a lot of fuel supplies trying to head long distance over to wherever you might think a friendly shore or island might be. And the worst case scenario, of course, is your carry gets sunk and you're either far too far away from a friendly shore, there's no other friendly carrier, or you have no ability to safely navigate in that given direction. And your only place to land has now been sunk, which did happen occasionally to some pilots. And in that case, what you would try and do is orbit the area uh, for as long as possible for two reasons. One, if your ship's gone down or is in the process of going down, if you're circling above it, then in theory, if there are friendly ships nearby that can try and help the survivors, then you can try and radio them and you can see them coming and they can see where you're circling a lot easier if you stay up in the air until your fuel runs out. Um, secondly, it also means that well, you stay in the air as long as possible. And as we've said before, when it comes to survival at sea, every minute you spend away from the water is another minute longer when you're in the water. Um, that someone has time to come and rescue you. So if you, if your aircraft, say, has an hour's fuel left, then that's another hour that you get. Because if you were, let's, obviously you don't know, but let's say you would slip away from hypothermia 12 hours after you enter the water, then if you stay orbiting in the air, then that means for an hour before your plane runs out of fuel, then you have 13 hours for your rescuers to try and come and find you as opposed to 12 so that's all good um and yeah you can signal rescuers yourselves but that's this is uh basically what you do and then eventually you would try and ditch and hopefully there would be some rescuers nearby at least one japanese carrier's pilots ended up in this situation and they ended up just circling and then eventually ditching near some destroyers that had come to try and assist the survivors of the carrier itself and of course, if your plane is as empty as possible, bearing in mind that fuel does weigh a fair amount, then the light of the plane, the light of the landing, and also the light of the plane and the less damage you take on landing, the fractionally higher chances there are of the aircraft staying afloat for a certain amount of time. Now, some aircraft were actually deliberately designed to float, or at least stay afloat for a reasonable amount of time before sinking, specifically to help with survival, but even heavier aircraft you want it to stay afloat as long as possible, even if it's just staying afloat 10 or 15 seconds longer so you can get out, if, even if it's not going to act as a very oddly shaped boat for you. Vinve asks, when the Royal Navy acquired French and Spanish ships during the Napoleonic Wars and took them into service, did this create any logistical problems? Well, we've discussed in other videos about some of the issues that were caused by having French and Spanish ships in British service, namely that they tended to need more maintenance because of their longer nature, as opposed to the slightly squatter and more rugged nature of most British warships at the time. Um, but whilst expensive, that's not necessarily a logistical problem for the fleet, unless the fleet has been out for quite a while or run into a severe storm and it's having to ditch some of its uh, foreign built ships back to port to make good damage that the other ships haven't taken. But such a clear delineation would usually be quite rare because obviously wooden ships decay over time anyway so uh, a, let's say a French 80 gunner that's been in dock six months ago 
will probably ride out a storm better than a British 74 gunner that's last seen a dock half a decade previously. Um, so that much is not so much of a problem, um, except to say on very long voyages. The single biggest logistical issue would actually be more to do with the guns, because the French used 36-pounder, um, everyone kind of used 24-pounders, and smaller guns are kind of all over the place. But yeah, the heavier end of things, when the Royal Navy is using a 32-pounder, the French is using a 36-pounder, which is a French 36-pounder. So it's not 36 British pounds, it's actually just over 38 British pounds, but never mind. Um, and the Spanish, obviously, with their own weights and measure system, using slightly different guns again at the upper end. Um, that could cause some logistical problems because it uh, it would mean that you'd have to manufacture different ammunition if you wanted to keep those guns on the ship or you'd have to replace those guns and obviously guns are relatively valuable things and relatively certainly at the upper end relatively powerful things so you wouldn't necessarily be too keen on stripping the ship completely of its main guns and then having to pay for replacements uh, 32 pounders to be put in but with the, um, should we say, somewhat generous ammunition tolerances for the time, it wasn't unheard of for a captured uh, ship to keep its non-standard weight guns because you might find that you could make do. I mean, as long as the ba the bore of the barrel isn't too far removed from your own guns, um, certainly at this kind of period, then as if it's slightly larger, then a little bit more wadding and you can probably fit your standard ammunition in and just accept a slight reduction in accuracy. Whereas obviously if the gun is slightly smaller than your ammunition, you're not getting the ammunition in even without any wadding. So um, in that respect, have the French ships having a slightly heavier um, lower deck gun on their heaviest ships of the line probably was a lot better than if they'd gone with say a 30 pounder which was a uh, actually ironically enough a weight they went for after the napoleonic wars so yeah some potentials for logistical problems but n not a massive amount and certainly nothing compared to what you'd expect when you get into the age of steam and steel because ultimately sails are sails ropes are ropes masts are masts um, albeit they could be made up of various different woods and uh, compounds or single uh, pole masts um, so all of that kind of stuff could be repaired pretty much just the same as any other ship would be, uh, with the sole possible exception we're talking about in the Napoleonic era, that the Royal Navy had started mass production of things like pulley blocks, so that would help, actually, um, logistically, because instead of having to deal with dozens and dozens and dozens of independently separately handcrafted pulley blocks no two of which were exactly alike as and when things broke or got in need of replacement the Royal Navy took out yep here is a, a bucket load of standard issue pulley blocks have fun fitting out the ship and it probably actually become marginally more efficient <laughs> as a result Matt Blom asks, within the development of various metal warship armour types, which was the most revolutionary step between the current standard armour and the next step up? I would say it's actually probably the development of Harvey Steel armour. The single greatest leap in terms of individual leaps of protection was from compound armour to nickel steel armour. However, the time between nickel steel armor being developed as a suitable replacement for compound armor and then the harvey uh nickel steel armor being developed was actually relatively short so there's a, a relatively short window with relatively few ships which actually just went with nickel steel armor um, there, there are a few um but broadly speaking the leap from compound armor actually in a lot of designs goes from compound straight to harvey and so this is probably the single most revolutionary leap because if you look at uh, at least in terms of main battleship classes the royal navy for example goes from using 18 inches of compound armor on the royal sovereigns to the next big class battleship there's a tiny centurion class and a one-off renown in the middle but basically when they get to the majestics which is the next big class of frontline battleships they go to harvey armor and suddenly the armor thickness is halved and that halving of the armor thickness 
allows all sorts of things like the abandonment of open barbettes in favour of fully armoured barbettes, what we would later on call turrets. Uh, it allows much higher freeboard to come back in the ships, which in turn allows for much more speed, etc. and so on. So it's really the development of the Harvey armour that opens up the way for what we would consider to be the classic pre-Dreadnought battleship, because without it, too much weight has to go into protection, and a lot of those other features just aren't affordable. MG asks, which historical battle results were improbable enough that no one would take such a result seriously if it was achieved by prior wargaming before these engagements? Well, it probably depends whose side you're on. <laughs> um, certainly the Japanese were very confident that Midway was definitely going to go their way, and yeah, on a very, very high level analysis, when you look at number of carriers on each side, etc., you they think, yeah, sure, that's that that's definitely going to go away. It'd be really, really difficult for us to lose. I mean, once you go closer into the details, sort of numbers of aircraft aboard each vessel and um, number of therefore aircraft collectively available to both sides, things start to look a little bit closer. But well. That's why you always study the details. The Battle of Jutland Run to the South is also uh, another good one. <laughs> um, my, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's me, of course I'm going to rag on BT, but come on. Take any war game and go, okay, we're giving you four of the most powerful battleships on the planet at the time. Plus we're giving you six to five odds in battle cruisers alone, so overall you have two to one odds with the Queen Elizabeth there really, really outweighing it all, you can't possibly lose, and and, and then you lost. Although, on the flip side, the, when 5th Battle Squadron showed up, they did kind of show that, to be perfectly honest, 5th Battle Squadron probably could have soloed um, Hipper's forces without too much trouble. I mean, they would have had one lot of force concentration. But okay, 5th yeah. Battle Squadron in New Zealand um, probably could have soloed. The first battle that Admiral Yi took his turtle ships into would be another good candidate, because at that point there would have been an unknown quantity. They'd just be, well, we, we have a slightly tougher version of our normal ships, possibly, and they have a lot, lot, lot more. So, in theory, they should win quite easily, and then they didn't. The reason I say one of the initial battles is because, well... Um, once Admiral Yi had proven just how good a commander he was, and just how lethal the turtle ships could be when they were used properly... Um, if you then wargamed out subsequent battles in Admiral Yi won, you wouldn't exactly be surprised. Oh, yes, and of course, I mean, there's so many other options that you can pick from, but there's one I definitely want to mention, uh, which is criminally underappreciated, I think, um, and definitely will have its own Wednesday video at some point. The Voyage of the Spanish Treasure Ship Dash Warship Glorioso. I strongly advise you to read up on that if you want a wonderful story of, and, and how exactly are you still alive? Um, which is great to read, actually. Darren Liu asks, Did the Germans have any plans to develop a ballistic missile or guided missile submarines toward the end of the war, given the development of the V-1 and V-2, and their ongoing efforts to deploy the first generations of surface-to-air missiles? Would such ships have been feasible even with the technology at the time, or immediately after World War II? Well, in terms of overall feasibility, here's a V-1 that's been cunningly repainted in US colours, being launched from a US submarine shortly after the war, so technically, yes, it's perfectly possible. Um, there are stories, and to a certain extent records, that the Kriegsmarine was interested in looking at trying to mount a V-1 on various U-boats during the latter part of the war, but, well, the V-1 belongs to the Luftwaffe, which means it belongs to Hermann Göring, and if you think Göring is going to give the Kriegsmarine anything other than a middle finger, you are sadly mistaken. Um, especially by late war, when I think Göring was on, like, something approximating all the drugs, but never mind. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of founded. There were also ideas, again, I believe, to try and launch a V2, um, although apparently that was more of a carry a pot or tow a pod with a V2 in it, and then set that up kind of like a gigantic missile launching mine, rather than actually uh, 
strapping a V2 and all of its associated wonderful explosive fuels inside a U-boat. <laughs> um, but obviously neither of these came to pass. So they didn't. They didn't happen in the end. Um, I, I, I have my doubts as to the effectiveness of them. Um, even the US tests, when they were launching V1s and V2s off of practically anything that floats, including an aircraft carrier, um, rather illustrated the point that with only basic guidance systems, even hitting a city at any kind of significant distance is going to be a problem, uh, especially with the V2 when you're talking about suborbital mechanics and even the slightest bit off on uh, your launch or your calculations or your gyroscopes and it's going to go hor horrifically wrong. The V1, I can kind of see the V1 working, um, especially if the Germans had gone with some system similar to what the US has done here. If a U-boat had surfaced in relatively calm water, been able to orient itself at something the size of a city, at the, a relatively speaking, a decent distance, then yeah, a target as large as New York or some, something like that, they probably could have hit with a V1, although it would be an awful lot of effort to go through to get a single V1 or maybe two or three launched at a US city it would basically just be a symbolic attack more than anything else and well the time taken for the submarine to surface prepare and launch the V1 I have a feeling there would be a fair number of US ships and aircraft that might have something to say about that before it successfully got the launch off and so that brings us to the end of Dry Dock episode 110 thank you very much for listening and, well, there's just one or two small bits of channel admin to discuss. So there's good news and what could be seen as good news or bad news, depending on your point of view. The good news is that I've begun tentative, and I must stress tentative, planning for potentially revisiting the trip to the USA that was uh, scuttled by the pandemic all the way back in Easter this year. And I'm, as I say, very tentatively looking at effectively re repeating the same schedule, only in the Easter of 2021 instead. That's kind of predicated to a certain degree on everything being at least travelable, um, if not entirely back to normal by then. So we will see how that goes. I mean, they've they've got to start actually accepting bookings for flights that far in advance before I can even start to think beyond the loosest details but that's my intent at least so that's the good news the good possibly bad news depending again on how you look at it is that I've managed to secure a rather nice number of fairly rare naval photographs um, in considerable quantity um, from an archive that was being sold now that is good news because as and when this uh, scanner that is a few weeks ago was somewhere off the coast of Portugal and now may even be somewhere approaching the coast of the UK um, actually gets here I can start scanning those images in and I can start putting them up for public use which is good however as you might anticipate that does come with something of a cost and so the slight downside is that I do want to give everyone a heads up that I may be taking one or two sponsorships in the near future in order to help uh, pay for those. It won't be too many and it won't be massive or intrusive, but I'm sure you've seen some other history-based channels that have accepted uh, various sponsorship deals. I will, of course, always endeavour to ensure that any such deal like the one uh, I did quite a while ago and, and was actually the sponsor for the Battle of Tsushima video is relevant to the channel. They have relevant content that will be interesting to, to those of you um, who have an interest in naval history. But uh, yeah, just basically a heads up on that. Um, if you see it, don't be too alarmed. You know there's a good reason behind it and don't be too panicked that everything's suddenly going to become swamped because it's not. Um, I will remain very selective and only when necessary. So with that said, Thank you very much for listening. Hope to see you again in another video and let me know your thoughts on that particular little miniature bombshell in the comments below. Thank you very much. Bye.